tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Before the Great Revolution of 66, in which the Jewish nation declared independence from the Roman Empire, no fewer than five micro-revolutions occurred between 4 BC and 58 AD. In the years that led up to the First Jewish-Roman War, from 66 to 73, incompetent Roman governors repeatedly and egregiously antagonized the Jewish populace until there was no turning back. After the war that destroyed the temple that Herod had renovated in the year 70, Christians and Jews began parting ways. This episode will briefly cover the three Jewish-Roman wars and how Christians and Jews gradually began to separate. Here now is episode 482, Early Church History Part 2, The Jewish-Roman War and Jewish-Christian Relations. Early Church History Number 2, The Jewish-Roman War and Jewish-Christian Relations. I want to begin by mentioning to you our primary source for one of our primary sources for the Jewish war, and that is Flavius Josephus, who lived from 37 to 100 AD. He has two very famous books. One is called The Antiquities of the Jews, and the other is called The Jewish War. And he writes all about the Jewish war in incredible detail. I mean, I'm going to just very briefly cover it, give you the basics of the information. But he writes all about how this war broke out and how all these different movements collided and what happened before the war. There were significant, what I call early rumblings, early rumblings or revolutionary movements that occurred prior to the year 66. The first of which I'll mention is Athrangis in 4 BC. Herod the Great had died and he led a revolt, Athrangis did. He was a shepherd, tall and strong. He set himself up as a king He was a fierce warrior, and he had four brothers who were also uh, strong and tall in stature, and each had a posse of men. They actually crowned him king, and he reigned for three years until the Romans came. And initially, he even defeated the Roman soldiers that came for him. And uh, the Romans eventually wore him down, and he turned himself in to Archelaus, who was the son that took over for Herod the Great because he promised to spare his life. After him was Judah the Galilean in the year 6 AD 6, and that was someone who responded to taxation as a major issue. They wanted to raise the taxes. There was a governor named Quirinius who gave a census, and there was taxes. And so Judah the Galilean said, we're not, we're not paying your taxes, Rome, and he started a revolution. Josephus says that, the zealots traced back to Judah the Galilean in the year A.D. 6. The Romans eventually killed him and his followers scattered. Then we had the Samaritan prophet in the year 36 who stirred up a mob in Samaria, organized a march to Mount Gerizim, and he was camped out at the base of the mountain. And all these people, all these discontents from all over Samaria came and threw in their lot with him. And they are like, we're going to have a revolution. We're going to throw off these Romans and we're going to be free. And the Romans came and killed everyone. The governor at that time was a man named Pontius Pilate. He was governor from 26 to 36 AD. Thutis led a revolt in the year 45. He had brought his followers to the Jordan River and said he would command the river to part, providing them easy passage. And a great number of people joined his march. The Roman governor at that time, a man named Phaedus, sent a detachment of horsemen who overtook Thutis and killed many of them and took many alive. Thutis they took alive, the Romans did when they got him, and they cut off his head and carried it to Jerusalem. Thus ended another revolutionary. In the year 58, there was another movement led by someone called the Egyptian prophet. He was a prophet with thousands of followers gathered in the wilderness, and they eventually marched to the Mount of Olives. From the Mount of Olives, this Egyptian prophet said, that he would command, and like Jericho, the city walls of Jerusalem would fall. I don't think that happened. Instead, the Roman governor, at this time a man named Felix, ordered his soldiers to attack. 
They charged the Mount of Olives, killed 400 men, took 200 alive. The Egyptian escaped. No one ever heard from him again. So what does this tell you? Seeing all these revolutionary movements. People were unhappy. You don't keep revolting if life is good, everything is stable, you're making ends meet. You revolt when you're really profoundly unhappy. So there were legitimate grievances that the Jewish people had. One of them was when Herod the Great renovated the temple. He was uh, just finishing up on that as he died. He had an eagle, a golden eagle, installed above the entrance to the courtyard of the temple. And for a people whose holy book says you should have no carved images, to put a carved image of Rome, this eagle there was so offensive that a bunch of Jewish young men scaled the walls at night and cut it down. It crashed to the ground and they hacked it to pieces with hatchets. And then, of course, the Roman government responded by eventually executing 3,000 of uh, the people in Jerusalem because of this. So these are the kinds of things that are constantly happening. And that happened before Christ began his ministry, the incident with the eagle. There were other issues with taxation. Caesar's image was a real sensitive subject because, like, for example, Pontius Pilate, when he began, he brought in the image of Caesar on the standards of his soldiers. The standard is like a staff with a little flag on it and a picture of Caesar. And he brought him in at night because he knew the Jews would be very sensitive to it. They revolted. They just flipped out, and there was a whole issue with that, and eventually they were removed from the city. The Romans controlled the temple. They actually built a fortress right next to the temple, or renovated it, and they called it the Antonia Fortress. And the Antonia Fortress was where the Roman soldiers could overlook the courtyards of the temple and control what happened there. In fact, even the high priest's garments, the holy vestments, were stored in the Antonia Fortress and controlled by the Roman government. So you can see why there was a lot of revolution. During the time of Christ, calling him, and we don't want to get too much into this tonight, but calling him Christ, Messiah, anointed, king, was a hugely controversial kind of title because it meant that Jesus is claiming to be like one of these guys. And so the Romans are going to come and they're going to kill him. That's just what the Romans do when someone claims to be you don't have to be call, call yourself a king. You just call yourself a leader of a revolution or you just get too popular and the Romans will come and kill you. So it makes a lot of sense of the Jewish paranoia among the Sadducees why they were like, oh man, we got to get this guy. we got to hand him over now before there's a big incident. I think they did the wrong thing, but that's why they did the wrong thing. Josephus talks about four types of Judaism. He talks about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the fourth philosophy. That sounds mysterious, doesn't it, right? So the Pharisees were the Jews who focused on Torah. They focused on righteousness. How do we please God by how we live? That is the question that drove the Pharisees. The Sadducees focused on sacrifice, the temple, making sure that that system was running well and that they were giving the right amount of money to the Romans and that the Romans were allowing the sacrifices to occur. That was the purview of the Sadducees. They were powerful, elite, and wealthy. The Essenes lived way out in the desert, and they were living in communities that focused on purity, and they were waiting for the end of the world, and they thought the temple was hopelessly corrupted, and so there's no point in even offering a sacrifice there because the high priest is illegitimate, the, the Romans are in charge, the whole thing is shot, so let's just go out and live in the desert. Then there's the fourth philosophy, and this is Josephus' term. Josephus, once again, is the historian that wrote about all this stuff. Eyewitness, he was there during the war. He was captured by the Romans. He was in a situation where they were surrounded, and the, uh, the soldiers decided, and Josephus being the commander of the soldiers, they all decided they wanted to kill themselves rather than go over to the Romans. But they didn't want to commit suicide because they thought it was a sin. So they came up with an idea that, each person would stab his neighbor. So then, you, you know, you're, you're killing somebody else. You're not killing yourself. I don't know how that makes it better, to be honest. I don't, I don't know. But uh, everybody stabbed everybody. And then Josephus and his partner did not stab each other. And so he surrendered. And he survived the uh, mass suicide. And 
ended up becoming a translator and a very important person to the people who were conducting the war, which we haven't even started to talk about yet, so I'm getting ahead of myself. But the fourth philosophy, according to Josephus, were the revolutionaries. These were Jews who said, no king but God. These were Jews who said, God gave Abraham this land and to his descendants. I'm his descendants. Why are these Roman dogs running our country? God can't steer a parked car. You ever hear that expression? Let's get moving, and then God will work with us, in other words. They didn't have automobiles back then, obviously. But you know, this whole idea, this revolutionary impulse, that was what he called the fourth philosophy. Among the fourth philosophy was a sect called the Sicarii, and they were the ones who skulked around at night with hidden curved daggers up their sleeves, and they would cut the throats of Roman sympathizers among the Jews. And so they instigated a lot of trouble. So the first Jewish war occurred, and it's not Jewish war, I should say, first Jewish-Roman war occurred in the year 66. So that's only two years after the fire of Rome. That was 64. So this, that's in Rome. This is in Jerusalem, very far away. But two very, very significant events for early Christianity. So the first Jewish revolt occurred it was actually the first of three major revolts. I'm going to talk to you about the other two in just a minute here. It began in A.D. 66 in the 12th year of Nero. There were anti-taxation protests, and the Roman governor, a guy named Gessius Florus, plundered the temple. And temples and banks were kind of overlapping ideas in the ancient world. So you had a lot of treasures in the temple, and the governor decided to plunder it and arrest key leaders. This resulted in a massive rebellion. Jewish revolutionaries attacked the Antonia Fortress right next to the temple, overran it, causing King Agrippa II and his government to flee from Jerusalem. The Romans sent troops, but the Jewish revolutionaries ambushed them and killed an entire legion. 6,000 Roman professionally trained soldiers met their end at the Jewish rebels' hands. And they took the legion's aquila, which is the golden eagle that stood upon the standard, the staff that symbolized that legion's identity. So Nero sent Vespasian. Vespasian was a general whom Nero commissioned with four legions. Now, a legion is anywhere from five to 6,000 professionally trained Roman soldiers. And they invaded Galilee in the north. You don't just attack Jerusalem. You've got to make your way down to Jerusalem. So you start in the north, and you fight the revolutionaries up there. And you make your march city by city. The zealots and thousands of refugees, they would flee from the Roman soldiers as they were advancing and eventually find their way to Jerusalem, swelling the city way beyond its normal population. Then... Something crazy happened. Nero died in the year 68. So the war starts in 66. They're making their way towards Jerusalem. 68, Nero, the emperor dies, creating this huge power vacuum in Rome. And so there are three men vying for the throne of Rome, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. And so Vespasian, who's in charge of the entire army that's attacking on its way to attack Jerusalem, says, I need to go back to Rome. I need to go back to Rome and claim the throne for myself. So Vespasian does that. He goes back to Rome, he claims the throne, he beats out the other guys, and he becomes the Roman emperor in the year 69, putting his son Titus in charge to finish the war. So Titus lays siege to Jerusalem in the year 70. And it, he's there laying siege for seven months. There's horrific infighting inside the city of Jerusalem, Jewish sects and factions fighting with each other. At one point, they even destroy their food supplies making it harder to hold out against the Roman army that has surrounded the city of Jerusalem. They eventually, the Romans breached the walls, killed thousands upon thousands of people. I think one of the reports was that they were crucifying like hundreds of people every day in the sight of the city, of people that were deserting the city. The Roman soldiers would capture them and crucify them so people would see in the city, this is what happens to you. Just brutal, brutal stuff happened at this time. They eventually captured the temple, Titus did, and that included the menorah and the table that had the sacred bread on it, 
which was, these are items that normally only a priest would be able to see. These items were plundered from the temple and just paraded around in the city. And he also burned the temple to the ground. So this is the temple that originally was rebuilt. So you have the first temple, Solomon's temple. The second temple, about 70 years after Solomon's temple was destroyed, they rebuilt. And uh, that temple was renovated by Herod for probably like almost a century. Uh, he was working on it, maybe, maybe less than that, maybe it was 50 years. But like it had been working on it for so, such a long time, finally finished this beautiful, like most amazing building in that part of the world. And now it was burned and destroyed by the Roman legions under Titus. Titus then brought some captives to Rome in the year 71. He went to Rome, and he brought these captives in what's called a Roman triumph. This is a parade of all these captured soldiers and uh, different kinds of people that you, that you find. And then he also had the leader. He had the leader of the revolution, someone named Simon Ben-Giora, and they marched the leader all the way to the Tarpian Rock at the Temple of Jupiter and threw him off, which is an 80-foot drop in a ceremony. And this Roman triumph is commemorated by a panel on the Arch of Titus. To this day, you can go to Rome, and on the Arch of Titus, you can see this panel, which shows, you can see, obviously, the menorah there that was in the temple in Jerusalem and captured by the Romans and paraded through the city in the year 71. However, the Jewish revolt was not yet done. There were still people hiding out in a fortress called Masada. And in the Masada fortress, we're talking about a massive plateau upon which is built a fortress that would be so hard to attack. And yet those Romans were so persistent that they just threw earth up and up and up until they built a ramp that they eventually were able to, in the year 73, get to the top of Masada. And there were 960 Jewish defenders in the fortress, and they were going against 10,000 soldiers under the Roman governor, Sextus Bassus. And they decided that they weren't going to make it, so they all committed suicide. Or maybe they did the Josephus stab thing, I don't know. But they, they were found dead, by the soldiers when they finally got to the top. And thus ended the first Jewish-Roman war. It was a really bloody war. A lot of Romans died. A lot of Jewish people died. And the temple was lost. And it's like, it's just such a crazy thing because that event in 70, that stands true to this day. There's never been a rebuilt Jewish temple Thousands of years later, still not, not rebuilt. So a really massive event in history. Let's talk about the Christians' response to the war. Jesus had said in Luke 21, verse 20, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Now, I know there are different interpretations about this, but if you were first-gen first century person who had heard these words or read these words, and you saw Jerusalem get surrounded by armies, you going to stay? Let me read it again. Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are in the country enter it. Duh. Meanwhile, everyone else is entering it, like I mentioned, because it's a strong city. Verse 22, For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill what is written, Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled." So the earliest Christians who were living, these are Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem, because of the words of Christ, left the city. I don't know if like every single one left the city, but I know that later historians referring back to this, specifically Eusebius, the church historian who wrote a book called Ecclesiastical History, he says the following, The death of the rest of the apostles was plotted in numerous ways, and they were driven from the land of Judea. This guy's writing 
a couple hundred years after the facts, okay? But he's still the earliest source that we have about this. They went their way to teach the gospel among all the nations, supported by the power of Christ, who said to them, going, teach ye all nations in my name. But the people of the church at Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to esteem men there to depart from the city and to inhabit a city of Perea, which they call Pella. So that's the idea. Those who believed in Christ migrated to this city from Jerusalem, that when holy men had entirely abandoned the royal capital of the Jews and the entire land of Judea, the judgment of God might soon overtake them for their many crimes against Christ and his apostles and utterly destroy that generation of the wicked from among men. So that's his interpretation of why God allowed the Romans to destroy Jerusalem as punishment for Christ. That's Eusebius' interpretation, looking back on it. Another gentleman by the name of, well, he's not really a gentleman, but he's an author. He's a Christian author, kind of a jerk, actually. But a guy named Epiphanius of Salamis, writing about the year 375, he talks about Jewish Christianity as well. He says, This sect of Nazareans is to be found in Berea, near Col Syria, in the Decapolis, near Pella. That's the same city that Eusebius had mentioned. And in Bashanidas, at the place called Kokaba, or Kochaba in Hebrew, for that was its place of origin. Since all the disciples settled in Pella after they were removed from Jerusalem, Christ having told them to abandon Jerusalem and withdraw from it because of the siege it was about to undergo. And they settled in Perea for this reason, and as I said, lived their lives there. It was for this that the Nazarene sect had its origin. Okay, so what do we have? We have a massive, a massive war between the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, not just Jerusalem, but all the way down from Galilee to Samaria to Judea to Jerusalem as the soldiers progressed. This huge, huge battle that took, was it, four or five legions for them to win the battle. And you have Jewish people and you have Christian people that are Jews. And the Christian Jews ditched. They left. They escaped. They did not fight. So you can see why there might be some animosity between them. We don't have a lot of data about this, but what we do have is called the Berkat Hamanim. It means the blessing of the heretics. <laughs> okay, And it's really a curse, it's not a blessing. So maybe that'll help explain it. This is a uh, version of it that we have. It's called the Palestinian version. And this is said in the synagogue. Every Sabbath, you attend the synagogue. It's one of the 18 benedictions said, the Berkat Hamanim. It says, For the apostates, let there be no hope, and uproot the kingdom of arrogance speedily and in our days. May the Nazarenes, which is what they call Christians, and the sectarians perish as in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be written together with the righteous. You are praised, O Lord, who subdues the arrogant. Now imagine yourself as a Jewish Christian, somebody who believes in Jesus, but you are of Jewish ancestry. You know, you believe in Jesus, but you still want to go to synagogue. You get through the benedictions, and then now you can't say these words. You're cursing yourself, right? So this is a Jewish response against Jewish Christians attending synagogue. And we don't know exactly when this became standard or when this was written, but we know that it was sometime towards the end of the, the, the first century or in the beginning of the second century because we know that in the year 160, Justin Martyr, a Christian, mentions it. And he's having a conversation with a Jewish person named Trypho, and Justin Martyr says, You, as in the Jews, reject those who hope in him and in him who sent him. God the Almighty and maker of all things, cursing in your synagogues those that believe on Christ. So we know that it was obviously before 160 when this was written because he mentions this as a standard practice of the Jewish synagogues. And I really love what Justin says in another place of his book, chapter 96 of Dialogue with Trypho. He says, For you, the Jewish people, curse in your synagogues all those who are called from him Christians. And... Other nations effectively carry out the curse, putting to death those who simply confess themselves to be Christians, to all of whom we say, you are our brethren. Rather, recognize the truth of God. 
And while neither they nor you are persuaded by us, but strive earnestly to cause us to deny the name of Christ, we choose rather and submit to death in the full assurance that all the good which God has promised through Christ, He will reward us with. And in addition to all this, we pray for you. I love this. This is the part I love. We pray for you that Christ may have mercy upon you. For he taught us to pray for our enemies also, saying, Love your enemies, be kind and merciful as your heavenly Father is. For we see that the Almighty God is kind and merciful, causing his Son to rise on the unthankful and on the righteous, sending rain on the holy and on the wicked, all of whom he has taught us he will judge. I love that. What a great Christian response to persecution. And there was a, a serious amount of persecution, not so much from the Jews in Justin's day, but from the Romans. And he's saying, look, we're praying for you. We're praying for you Jewish people who, who don't like us Christians. And we're praying for you Gentile people who don't like us Christians, that Christ would have mercy on you and that you would come to the truth. I think it's a pretty great example. So as you can see, there is a parting of the ways that starts to occur in the second half of the first century where Judaism and Christianity are starting to split directions. Christianity, Jewish Christianity, welcomes Gentiles into it and decides, this is a New Testament thing, but decides that Gentiles don't need to keep the law in order to be full Christians. That's in the uh, book of Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. Okay, so after that, now Gentiles and Jews are doing community together as Christians, meeting together and even eating together, which is really radical when you think of a Jewish kosher diet, right, and and sitting at table with Gentiles. And then as time goes on, there is a parting of the ways where Judaism itself is separating itself from allowing any Christians to attend synagogue. And Christians are starting to think, I don't really want to be associated with these Jews either because they're revolutionaries, they're rebels, they have a bad reputation now with the Roman government and with society at large. And I'll explain how that worked in just a second. The tragic consequence of this parting of the ways, which wasn't like a clean break, it was a slow, steady process. The tragic consequence of it is that we lost our Jewish roots as, as, as Christians, Michael Holmes comments on this in his book, The Apostolic Fathers. He says, Though less noticed at the time, the gradual closure of synagogues to Christians also meant the loss of an important source of learned converts for the church. From this point on, the intellectual focus of the church would shift increasingly toward the Greek philosophical tradition from which a growing percentage of the more intellectually inclined converts was being drawn. Thus, what began as a Jewish reform movement increasingly moved toward expressing its most fundamental tenets in terms drawn primarily from Greek philosophy. In the year 96 AD, 96, when Christians successfully petitioned the emperor Nerva to exempt them from the Jewish tax on the basis they were not Jews, from then on, practicing Jews would have to pay the tax and Christians would not the parting of the ways widened even further. However, Judaism did not die in the first Jewish war with Rome. Judaism reorganized itself. The Sadducees were gone. The Essenes died in the war. The fourth philosophy died in the war. But you know who survived? Pharisees. The Pharisees organized themselves, and this is the birth of rabbinic Judaism in the late first century, where the Pharisees had survived the war, and they organized at Yavna, or Jamnia, in the late first century, and they were able to really start asserting, over time, influence over Jews, not just in that region, but throughout the Mediterranean world, because there were lots of Jews living in all the different cities of the empire. And they completed the Mishnah, in the year 200, and the Talmud in the year 500, Jewish learning continued to progress, continued to carry the torch of the Hebrew language and of their traditions all the way up to today where there are lots of Jewish people who are still able to read the Old Testament, what they call the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Old Testament. They just call it the Bible. Uh, And they're still practicing these different ways of living. The Talmud, just to give you a sense of it, is 63 tractates totaling over 5,000 pages of content. 
Well, that's not the end of the story. There were, like I mentioned before, three major Jewish-Roman wars. The first one was the first Jewish-Roman war, kind of a lame title for a war, if you ask me, uh, 66 to 73. The second one has a name. It's from 115 to 117. It's called the Kedos War. And this was outside of Judea. This was not in Jerusalem. Um, this was in the cities of Cyrene and Cyprus, the island Mesopotamia and Egypt. And what happened there was a wide-scale revolt of Jewish people. One historian, a guy named Cassius Dio, estimates that as many or, or even more than 400,000 Romans were killed during these Jewish revolts in the early 2nd century. So the Romans sent a general with legions, like they always do, and they quashed the revolt. The name of the general was Lucius Quietus, whose name kind of got shortened to Kedos. And so it's called the Kedos War after the general who put it down. It was a Jewish war against the Romans outside of the land of, of Israel. You can read about it in history. Then there was the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which occurred from 132 to 135, and that was back in Jerusalem. Now, they had not destroyed Jerusalem. They had damaged it severely in the first war, but what is damaged can be rebuilt. And so Jerusalem is, is fully rebuilt, and, but except for the temple. The temple is still laying in ruins. And Simon Bar Kosoba was recognized, he was a leader who was recognized as a Messiah. He was actually proclaimed to be Messiah at this time. And they renamed him Bar Kokhba. Kokhba is the Hebrew word for star, based on the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, which says, A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So they're thinking this Bar Kokhba, the son of the stars, what that translates to in English, that he's going to be the one to save us. Sadly, he does not succeed. The Romans send legions. The Jews fight with the Romans. Everybody dies. A lot of people die. Uh, the end result was the destruction, not just of the temple that had already been destroyed, but now of Jerusalem itself. The whole city is pretty much destroyed. And the emperor at this time, a guy named Hadrian, outlaws Jews from Jerusalem. He says, we're not allowing any more Jews in Jerusalem. If you're in Jerusalem, you start a revolt, you cause problems. You're never allowed to, from now on till forever, you're never allowed to go to Jerusalem again. And he forbade any Jews in the region from teaching Torah. You're not allowed to teach your law, and you're not allowed to live in Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of Jews died during this revolt. Cassius Dio estimates 580,000 men slain among the Jews in raids and battles, not counting those who died in famine and for other reasons like sickness. Nearly all of Judea was left desolate. And so the Romans decided, we're going to build a new city. And Hadrian had a new city built on the ruins of Jerusalem called Aelia Capitolina and built a temple in it to Jupiter on the site where the Jewish temple used to be outlawed Jews from coming, and renamed the land, instead of Judea, he called it Syria-Palestina, named after the Philistines, the Jews' ancient enemy. A brutal end to living in the land. These rebellions, you can imagine, made Christians not want to associate very much with Jews in other cities in the area of the Mediterranean world because Jews are always fighting with the Romans. And Christians have enough problems with the Romans already because we don't do the sacrifices and we don't worship Caesar and we don't offer a pinch of incense. So like we got our own problems. And so you can see how like there would be a lot of tension between Christians and Jews throughout the Roman Empire during this end of the first century, beginning of the second century. And there really was this parting of the ways. These rebellions made Christians and others not want to associate with the Jews, but there still was plenty of interaction. It's, there's no such thing as a clean break. Uh, there's still plenty of, of interaction. I'll get to that in just a second, but I want to review first. All right, as I mentioned to start, Josephus is a primary source. If you want to learn more about the Jewish war, especially the first Jewish war, read Josephus. He's got a book called 
the Jewish war. The war of the Jews, right? So like, he'll tell you way more than you ever wanted to know about it, okay? He was there, eyewitness, great guy to, to, to hear what he has to say about it. We talked about early revolutionary movements before 66. These are movements that either happened before Christ, during his life, or shortly after his life, right up until the year 66 when the big revolution happened. We talked about the four types of Judaism. We talked about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the fourth philosophy. We saw that the fourth philosophy were the Jewish rebels who were revolutionaries, and we saw that the Pharisees were the ones that actually survived the war, regathered Judaism in a different place, and really got rabbinic Judaism going. We looked at the first Jewish war of 66 to 73 and how the Christians fled to Pella, which is a city outside of the region where they would be safe from Roman uh, soldiers. And we talked about the exclusion from the synagogues. And last of all, we talked about the second and third Jewish-Roman wars. This is all really important history to understand Jewish-Christian relations during this period. If you're just reading, say, for example, Justin's book, The Dialogue with Trifo, where it's a Christian and a Jew talking to each other, and you don't realize that the book is set right after the Bar Kokhba revolt, that this guy is fleeing from it, and Trifo says to Justin, do you really think Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt? Do you believe in the, the kingdom of God prophecies, in other words? It means a lot more when you realize the city's lying in, in, in ruins and, or it's been rebuilt with another city on top of it and we've already revolted as much as we can revolt. There's no more revolting. There's no more Messiah. There's nothing else to do. Now Justin says, yes, I do believe in it. I do believe that there is, the Messiah is going to come. That city is going to be rebuilt again. It's just like, wow, that makes a lot more sense when you understand the history behind it. Now, Jewish Christianity is an interesting phenomenon, and, and there's not that much uh, that people do with it. It's usually basically ignored in church history classes. But I think it's really important, and I think Jewish Christians have something to, to say, and I think they preserved some truths that the rest of the church ended up losing, and we're going to talk about them next time. Okay, So we're going to get into it just briefly a little bit about the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, which are these different names associated with Jewish Christianity next time. I also want to mention this too, that Christians still did sneak into synagogues centuries later. Like there's this preacher named John Chrysostom in the 300s, and he's berating his congregation. Why are you going to the synagogue? Why do you want to go there and, say, and get the blessing? Why do you want to go there for healing? Why do you want to go there to swear an oath? So you don't have sermons like that unless Christians are still interested in visiting synagogues, right? And uh, some Jews are interested in dialoguing with Christians. Origen, for example, origin of Alexandria. He died in the year 253, so it's a couple hundred years later. He learns Hebrew, and he has a teacher, and he has dialogue with Jewish people. So there is a parting of the ways, but it's not that there's no contact at all for the rest of time. There is still some contact. And we'll talk more about that next time as we continue our journey through early church history. Well, that brings this episode to a close. What'd you think? Come on over to restitutio.org and find episode 482 about the Jewish-Roman War and Jewish-Christian relations, and leave your feedback on the website. We'd love to hear from you. A number of people have commented in on the last episode, which was kind of an introduction covering the basics of the first century and a little bit of the fire of Rome during the time of Nero and the persecution of the Christians in that early second half of the first century. JJ wrote in saying, thanks for this fantastic, energetic, and faithful presentation. Deborah wrote in, I love Bible history. I've listened to your series on the historical Jesus over and over. Thank you so much. And my old teacher, Joe Martin, or as I like to call him, Dr. Joe, wrote in saying, great summary. The whole was excellent. The Tacitus reading was interesting. Our Christus will continue to change the cosmos, this order of things. Well, thanks everyone for writing in and for your encouraging feedback. Uh, church history, as many of you probably know, is a passion of mine, not just because it's weird and interesting, although that is true, uh, but also because it helps me to understand what in the world happened 
in the story of Christianity? How do we end up with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Eastern Orthodox Church, with the Protestant churches, with liberal Protestantism in America and Europe, and much more? Uh, these, these kinds of questions, and how, how do beliefs change over time? Why, why did Christianity eventually reject this in favor of that? And what were the players, and what were their reasons? To me, honestly, a lot of this is investigative. I just want to know, and really the only way to do that is to get an overview, and that's what this class is doing. And so I hope that it will give you the overview you need to research the different topics that you're interested in. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. We'll see you next week, and remember, the truth has nothing to fear.